Well, hey there, freaks. It's your boy Marty Bent here to introduce this week's episode. I was joined by Matt this week. Had the immense pleasure of sitting down with uh, Bitcoin Core contributor Andrew Chow. We talked a lot about partially signed Bitcoin transactions, um, uh, coin joining, coin selection, uh, video games, a bunch of other stuff. Andrew is uh, an incredibly talented and young mind. Fucking young guns crushing it these days. Um, this was an incredible episode. Went for a while. I think we almost went two hours on this one. Um, so I highly recommend you stick through it. We cover a lot. Towards the end, we talk about coin selection and dust. It's uh, a fascinating um, problem. Problem. A fascinating, uh, I want to say problem. Um, maybe it's a problem in some people's minds. What's the word I'm looking for here? Uh, a fascinating variable we all have to, uh, to take into consideration. So I... Uh, I think you guys are going to like this one. Um, Again, Andrew's incredibly bright and doing some incredible things. For you freaks that don't know, he is the creator, uh, the creator, inventor, I don't know. He created the uh, PSBT standard, which a lot of the wallets are now using to to build their um, partially signed Bitcoin transaction software so that they can communicate between each other. Um, We go through why this is important and how. Um, it's been accomplished up to this point and what, what may be um, uh, enabled by this moving forward. This episode of Tales from the Crypt is brought to you by the Cash App. You freaks already know all about them. Cash App is the simplest way to send and save money. You already know. They're letting you stack slivers of stonks now if you want to. We're changing it from shares to stonks. It's just too easy to say. I, I, the shares, uh, it's too much to think. Stonks is just right on the top of my mind. All right. Cash App investing is here. Unlike investing tools that only let you buy entire shares of stonks, Cash App lets you instantly invest as little or as much as you want. This way, when your favorite company stock is just a little too expensive, you can still own a piece with as little as $1. Okay. You can buy slivers of stonks now. You don't have to. The option is there. I'm not saying go buy stonks on the Cash App. If you so please, the option is there. You can still stack sats, send sats, receive sats. Stack more sats on the app. Incredible Bitcoin buying experience is still there as well. Um, and because your Cash App is directly connected to your bank account, you don't have to wait four to five da- days. Da- 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 sorry, excuse me. You don't have to wait. I want Porky to pig there on you guys. You don't have to wait four to five days um, for inbound transfers. You can start investing today. Uh, broker servers are provided by Cash App Investing, a subsidiary of Square, a member of SIPC. And as always, as always, Use the code stacking sats when you sign up. That's one word S T A C K I N G S A T S. You're going to get $10, and Cash App is going to send $10, a thousand pennies to our good friends at Owls Lacrosse. <coughs> Download the Cash App from the App Store or Google Play Store today and enjoy this episode with Andrew Chow. I know I certainly did. Okay. What is up, freaks? Welcome back to Tales from the Crypt. It's your boy Marty Bent here, fresh off a recording of Rabbit Hole Recap. We cut that one short because we have a very special guest. I say we, Matt Odell is with me. Matt, what's up? Cheers, guys. We are sitting down with Andrew Chow, engineer at Blockstream, and somebody I'm uh, very excited to sit down and talk about, uh, talk about, talk with about partially signed Bitcoin transactions, a big topic on the podcast uh, in the last couple of weeks. But before we get into PSBTs, Andrew... Why don't you just give us a little uh, intro to yourself, how you got into Bitcoin, and what drew you to, to PSBT in particular? Yeah. So I'm Andrew. Uh, I work on Bitcoin Core, and I'm engineer at Blockstream. Uh, I've been uh, working on this since I was in high school, like five years ago. <laughs> uh, where that, and that's where uh, a couple of friends of mine in high school introduced me to Bitcoin, because uh, they knew I was interested in technology and stuff. So, you know, I looked at it, uh, didn't have money to buy that much Bitcoin, and the technology was far more interesting. (laughs) So, what is that, 2014, what was the state of Bitcoin like at that point? I see you're a moderator on Bitcoin Stack Exchange at BitcoinTalk.org. Is that where you're getting most of your information at that point? Yeah, so at that time, uh, I was really active on Bitcoin Talk. Uh, I I didn't get onto Bitcoin Stack Exchange until fairly recently. But on Bitcoin Talk, um, this is actually how I got into development. I was hanging around in the 
development section and the tech support section. And occasionally you get someone that comes in with like some weird issue that looks like it could be a bug. And, you know, Bitcoin's open source and I don't want to ask other people for help. Uh, so I go digging through the source and I'm like, oh, well, that's a bug and it looks like I can fix it. So then that's how I got my first couple of pull requests open. Just like people report users do dumb things and they tell people about the issues they have and you can find bugs that way. Do you remember the first couple particular issues that you Not dealt with? at all. No. no. <laughs> <laughs> I'm sure you can find like, You can definitely find them just looking through my contributions on GitHub. They're, they're somewhere yeah. deep, deep in there. A lot of, a lot of contributions. Yeah. That, well, eh, before we get into PSPT, <laughs> uh, what's it like approaching Bitcoin Core and like making your first pull request? Were you nervous? Um, um, so I'd been on the IRC channel for just listening and watching how things go. Uh, I started like watching the meeting, the IRC meetings, and generally asking a few questions, talking to the developers. So by the time I got around to making a pull request, uh, it felt like, it didn't feel like a completely new thing to me, although contributing was still new. I think I had, I had made a few issues, just some other bugs I ran into also. Um, but yeah, it's the first time you do it, it is very daunting, because like, oh, you're, you're talking to Peter Walla and Greg Maxwell, and these are important people and it's very scary. <laughs> <laughs> well, it seems like you've garnered their respect pretty yeah. quickly. Um, so let's jump right into it. The way I found you was a presentation that you gave at the San Francisco BitDevs meetup, mm -hmm. I believe in the beginning of the summer. That was in, in May. In, uh, so the actual presentation was in It was released in May. 17, yeah. I think, or 2018, something like that. I think it was 2018. And... Uh, there was an issue with the recording or something that it got delayed for a while um, before it got released. Yes. So I, I found it when it was eventually released, I believe, in May. Um, but at the time you gave the presentation, whether it was 2018, 2018 yeah. uh, it seemed like a, a nebulous idea that had not been implemented yet. And since the standard has been uh, implemented and adopted by uh, many hardware and software producers and um, it seems that it's getting quick adoption. Mm -hmm. So I guess the good best place to start is what was the problem before you could partially sign a Bitcoin transaction before P PSBT. Um, but yeah. now there's a standard that makes it easier. Correct. So uh, this actually started in 2017. That's when I wrote the first drafts of the standard. Um, so in 2017, I was uh, still in college and I had I was interning at Blockstream over the summer. <clears throat> and while I was at Blockstream, um, I got a hardware wallet. And naturally, being a core contributor, working at a company that does a lot of things with core, I wanted to use my hardware wallet with core, but I couldn't. Uh, so, you know, I did this normal, like, stopgap measure of run your own Electrum server and use Electrum, but that's right. annoying. And who's going to do that if they want to, like, only hardcore people like me are going to run Electrum X. It's a pain in the ass. Like, <laughs> yeah, it's, for it's, hardcore people. It's it's annoying. Uh, it takes a lot of disk space, and it's it's and like Electrum doesn't always do the best job of uh, making sure information doesn't leak to the other servers. So um, when I was interning at Blockstream, I had I was just talking to Peter one day uh, about how we could get hardware wallets into Bitcoin Core, and he pointed me to a few issues and we were talking and we eventually landed on, well, not eventually, but pretty quickly, uh, came up with basically we needed some software that does all the talking to the hardware wallet and some way to call out to and talk to that software. Well, that software is what is now called HWI. Uh, it's a project I've been working on a lot recently and the way to talk to it is PSPT. So we just wanted one simple thing that contained all the transaction information that we could dump on a command line and send it to send to HWI or something else. Yeah. So before HWI and um, PSBT, it would basically had babble between the different yeah. software and hardware projects, correct? Yeah. So one of the main issues I had run into when I was uh, working with Core and the Electrum wallet was that Core and Electrum use like they have a 
they had a partially signed transaction format that wasn't well specified and was like half compatible with each other. Um, if you took the straight hex out of Core and gave it to Electrum, it would reject it. If you took it from Electrum and gave it to Core, it would also reject it. If you like spliced a few things in and added a couple bytes here and there and removed some bytes here and there, you could get it to work. It's just annoying. <laughs> Yeah. <laughs> um, uh, this really became a problem actually when Bcash forked off. Why is that? Because I needed to move my coins. <laughs> and there's no way I'm running their software. So uh, I had to modify Electrum's format to work with a Bitcoin ABC node so I could broadcast it and like track, get the input and stuff. Yeah. And. Why are partially signed transactions important or useful in the first place? So, well, they contain all of the information you need to complete the transaction. Uh, there's fields for the signature, for any scripts that you need, and fields for the um, UTXOs and the keys and their derivation paths. So one of the, since PSPT was initially designed with hardware wallets in mind, one of the things that you need to do for a hardware wallet is to tell it the derivation path for the key to sign with. And so PSPD has a field for that. And since hardware wallets aren't connected to the blockchain, you also need to give it the UTXO so it knows how to sign because the UTXO is included in the uh, signed data. And then in meet space, why would somebody want to conduct and then, yeah, so, construct a transaction in this fashion? Uh, PSPT, the, the other benefit is that it's one thing, one string that you can copy and paste around. So uh, you can move it to another, uh, you can create one on one software and then copy it to another one and it should still work if they both support it. One of the issues that Core had was it its transaction format didn't contain all the necessary information that you needed to sign it. You had to like pass in, you had to pass in a JSON array of JSON objects which requires special escaping if you're using like bash. It's just generally annoying to use. Uh, and it was th separate things and you have to know what you're doing. So PSPT puts it all together in one thing that for a normal user, you don't really need to know what's inside of it. It just has everything. Yeah, it's got a standard that works. And yeah, so it's also, it's also a well-defined standard. Why which, do you say that? Uh, because none of the other transaction formats were well-defined <laughs> or standards. <laughs> so what do you mean by well-defined? Like, the, if you read the BIP, it tells you, like, exactly what, where the bytes go and what you're supposed to put in the PSPT. Um, I had to... Electrum had a similar-ish thing where they were using keys. Uh, Electrum did everything based on keys, which doesn't generalize well to scripts. Uh, but that one... I had a hard time figuring out how it worked and I had to like reverse engineer the source code to to figure that out. Uh, but PSPT, you don't really have to do that. It's specified in the BIP. Um, and if it isn't, that's a bug. <laughs> and I'll fix it. And before, uh, before this well-defined standard existed, uh, was the uh, non-existence of this standard holding people back from building stuff? Like uh, now that there is a standard, what does this enable? Um, well, it enables our original goal of getting hardware walls to work with Core. <laughs> that's, that's at least one thing it does. I'm not sure about... I guess uh, people have been using it for other stuff. Um, but those kind of, like, other things that you could use PSPT with weren't necessarily on my radar when I designed it. What are some examples of that? Uh, well, a lot of people want to use it for multisig now. <laughs> which it makes a lot of sense with multisig. Yeah, right? I guess it does. Uh, that was something I had thought of briefly uh, before I went back to working on it for hardware wallets first. Um, I guess, yeah, multi-sig is something that's mentioned in the BIP. Yeah. That's something you can do. Because uh, Shores Provost just came out with the nth key, right? And that's... Yeah, that uses PSPT. PSP for multi-sig specifically, mm -hmm. correct? Mm hmm Yeah. Um, although, now that people are using it for multi-sig or investigating using it for multi-sig, there have been a few issues that came up like uh there's some privacy issues like you'll leak your derivation path if you care 
it might be it might be some important information might might not be it's not particularly private but uh you try you want to try to expose as little information as possible to your co-signers mm-hmm. so you leak your derivation path if you don't drain the wallet when you move uh, a utxo and then somebody could use that to attack whatever's well, left or well, with your derivation path you can for for one key you get the derivation path where you can infer what the derivation paths of like the other keys in your After wallet are, are yeah right um <clears throat> we have a there's a there's a way you can mask it like just give half the derivation path <laughs> but that requires some the wallet software to be able to handle that yeah at least your wallet software yeah basically you're leaking the derivation path to the Anyone who sees the PSBT, whether that's a cosigner or if someone intercepts the PSBT or something. Yeah, right? yeah. basically. There is the, uh, this shouldn't happen risk of someone stealing your master private key by doing the whole uh, unhardened thing with the child private key. with the, So you can take the child private key with the parent public key and then recover the parent private key if you use unhardened bit 32 derivation okay. that, that's a thing that can happen so you use an hd wallet you get a pub key then you make a private key from that yeah you, you make it you derive a child key mm-hmm. if you for some reason give the child key to someone else which you really shouldn't do and they also get that parent x pub they can now derive the parent private, private key, key and now derive the rest of your child keys which is a problem, but that's only for unhardened derivation. I mean, the private key is the biggest problem, right? Yeah, right. yeah. Um, so, uh, and PSPT, you can include an XPUB in it, and the derivation paths. So, if you had given one of your cosigners a private key for some reason, and then you give them an XPUB for them to sign, or you give them a PSPT for them to sign, they now get the XPUB. And they can check the derivation path to see if it's unhardened, and now they can try to reverse out that that uh, parent private key. And so, that XPub by itself is the XPub by itself is perfectly safe, except for privacy. Yeah, except for privacy. It could be a an it's, issue of privacy. It's just yeah. fascinating the uh, the externalities you have to take into consideration yeah. when building this stuff. Like how how do you approach this with the security first mindset? Mm-hmm. What uh, what are you thinking first? Yeah. So the the main thing though is. Uh, this requires someone to give someone else a private key, which is something that, you know, everyone just says, don't, don't give people your private keys. <laughs> like, why are your private keys going to someone else anyways? So it's mostly, uh, I consider it to mostly be a non-issue. Uh, but if someone has a use case for giving their private keys to someone, they, they should, they need to consider it. Be aware, be aware. <laughs> um, so what, uh, what's, I know you said there's use cases popping up that uh, you didn't expect, but what's what surprised you the most, and, and what do you expect to happen moving forward? Like, is it now that it's a standard? Are you are you moving on and working on something else, or is the standard have to be cleaned up and iterated on moving forward? Um, the standard is still growing, still changing. I mean, like the base format is basically locked in because multiple software are using it now. But uh, people have been coming up with other fields to add, other things that you want to consider. So like the XPUB thing was recently added because uh, people wanted to be able to do change detection, which I had completely forgotten about when I (laughs) wrote PSPT. Uh, But for a hardware wallet, they want to hide the change output because that confuses people. Uh, So they need some way to detect change. And... that was specifically for multi-sigs, so they can use the XPUB to derive the change address and then check if any of the outputs use that. Um, but the main use case I've seen so far has been uh, multi-sig. I think there's been a proposal for like some some commitment something. There's a there's a PR for that somewhere. And do uh, any? <laughs> I haven't really thought about it. 
I don't want to say looming, but do any of the potential uh, changes to Bitcoin Core in the future, like its Schnorr signatures or Taproot, affect PSBT in any way? They all get new fields. Okay. Uh, I guess I will need to re- rename the signature field to partial ECDSA signature because uh, I told, um, I guess it's Peter uh, who's been working on Taproot. I told him that, well, we discussed it too, that uh, Taproot should just get its own set of fields because it doesn't make sense to try to shoehorn them into the existing ones. I mean, we've got so many bytes available, <laughs> so it doesn't really matter if we just add a few few more fields for a Taproot. Okay. And it's then it's completely unambiguous as to what what everything is. And you, there's no like guessing, like, is this signature a Snore signature or an ECDSA signature? Yeah. It's fascinating, right? Because Satoshi really didn't create these standards in the beginning. And yeah. You have all these uh, disparate software projects building on top of Bitcoin, just building tools for themselves. And uh, it's one of the biggest worries that you create too much tech debt, that it's hard to go back. And you think this is catching this at this particular juncture of Bitcoin's life cycle is important. Mm-hmm. Catching, like creating a standard around this uh, is imperative moving forward. Yeah, I, th- I like, think Could so. it have gotten to a point where we were too far gone and there's too much babble? Well, I think that's unlikely. Or, well, I mean, we're kind of already there <laughs> to start with, but like, <laughs> we're pulling it back in. Yeah, right? it's like like we were already at a point where, when I when I started working on PSBT, we had three different formats I knew of. There was Core, Electrum, and Armory actually had its own thing too, because Armory is specifically designed for the air gap model, so they uh, wrote their own standard, and we had these three things, but. Uh, and then every hardware wallet manufacturer had their own thing in their APIs. It was already pretty confusing. Uh, but having PSBT is kind of bringing it all, like everyone's shifting to using that. So I don't think the timing really mattered. Uh, it just, it just happened to be convenient. It was, it, it, you had to find <laughs> out that we needed it, right? Or something. Yeah. yeah. It's, it's like, like such a big improvement that it's just like at any point it would have been helpful. Yeah. And it's, Exactly. And it's also one of those things like, well, why didn't someone bother to do this before? (laughs) (laughs) It does turn out that someone did. Uh, It's one of the very first BIPs. BIP 10 is specifies a format that is similar to PSBT, uh, but it was withdrawn. Why? I don't know. You know, (laughs) you can, you can look it up. It's, uh, it was written by the Armory uh, developer in 2012 i think it's pretty early um and it doesn't quite do everything it's not as extendable as psbt but uh, i think i find it interesting that someone had the idea before but no one wanted to use it yeah (laughs) timing maybe it was the time maybe Maybe timing is everything you know uh you just had to wait for bitcoin to mature to the point that there were there were competing well not standards but like multiple wallets that wanted to talk to each other yeah yeah and that and yeah, it's a crazy thing about Bitcoin Core too, because you have like a uh, Russ Yanovsky, uh, commonly uh, misunderstood as Ryan of Sky. Uh, <laughs> it will always be Ryan of Sky. <laughs> in my mind. But he's doing like some meticulous work to separate the node uh, and the wallet GUI, yeah. which is like a huge tech debt that once uh, that endeavor is is finished, it seems like it gives you guys uh, core contributors a lot of. Uh, open space to sort of work on more interesting mm-hmm. stuff. And I've been, um, the other part, the other stuff I'm working on for core is the descriptor wallets, which is, which is a prerequisite for having hardware wallet integration into core. And a big part of this has been to take all of the things in the wallet that are, uh, we basically call it script pub key management. And, put it into encapsulate that into its own object where if we want to change out what the script pub keys are and what's signing, we just swap out that object. So right now we have everything that currently exists. We just call it the legacy script pub key manager. And I just copied all the, all the code into that for now. But in, uh, in an upcoming change is to introduce a descriptor script pub key manager, which uses the output descriptors that Peter designed uh, that specify all the the script pub keys that we're using in that wallet. 
and then Shores Provost has the um, has another change which introduces the hardware wallet script pub key manager and that will deal with the hardware wallets oh shit so yeah this uh this change i'm making to encapsulate all the wallet stuff allows us to even further expand the wallet to do more and more things and more arbitrary things too yeah i saw you were talking about coin selection recently Um, yeah coin selections is a completely different can of worms that no one wants to touch (laughs) (laughs) uh I don't know. Apparently, so, I'm the expert on coin selection now <laughs> because I'm the last person who really modified it. It seems like this helped. This, but it's not It's not really related to... Um, it seems like that would help now. Uh, no, not really. Oh. Uh, it's a... Uh, because it doesn't deal with keys. Okay. Or script pub keys. That makes sense. Right? Yeah. So, uh, with our script pub key manager thing, the idea is that we have... Um, we have the script pub key manager that tells the wallet to watch for these script pub keys and the wallet will handle all the transactions and watching for those script pub keys. And then when we want to sign a transaction, it gets passed to the script pub key manager, which does all the signing and whatever stuff behind the scenes to spit out a working transaction. So that could be, so like right now we, we just have our bag of keys thing, Mm -hmm. but later that'll be a hardware wallet. It'll, it'll be, it will just pass off that transaction to a hardware wallet and Bitcoin Core's wallet doesn't really need to know about that. It's kind of a black box. That's pretty awesome. Yeah. So this lets us expand to do a whole lot more things. Like we'll get the hardware wallet. Once we get descriptors uh, and mini script, the wallet will now be able to do arbitrary scripts and, you know, whatever whatever we want <laughs> it'll make multi-sig and core wallet so much easier because right now it's kind of a pain well this is is this a testament to the conservative nature of bitcoin core and working on these hard projects over a long period of time instead of trying to throw them all in at once and um i'm not sure i would call it conservative i think it's mostly developer laziness what do you mean by that well i dropped a ginormous pr to do the change <laughs> and no one wanted to review it <laughs> that's so uh um, is that is it that nobody wanted to review it or there well, weren't enough it people scary. to review it and it looks scary overworked, right? and like you have a billion other prs to review this one would take you at least like multiple weeks of dedicated time just to work through the commits in general and uh you know a large pr like that no one wants to review it you have to break it down into smaller chunks for people to smaller easily digestible pieces for people to go to go through and that takes a lot more time a lot more prs a lot more comments now and just slowly well takes time i think this is a a perfect candidate for john newberry's pr review club maybe the month of february we can get on (laughs) this john Uh, i think they've actually already covered the prs for so you know i had the the one okay it was like 72 commits it was really big (laughs) (laughs) um it got split into like seven prs uh and each one has been taking quite a while. We're down to the last one, finally, for this for this split, just to get the script pub key manager split. We're down to the last PR. Then we'll get to descriptor wallets, which is another 20 or so commits on top of that. As, uh, a, as an engineer, what's the hardest part of this? Mentally framing it before you write the code, writing the code, or reviewing? Uh, I think it's really the reviewing uh, and the context switching. So, you know, I write the code, open a PR... And then people have to go review it. Well, what am I going to do in the meantime? I'm going to go do something else. Uh, Lately, I've been working on fixing up, uh, working on the descriptor wallet itself, the descriptor wallet PR itself, or HWI or some Blockstream stuff or something else. But then someone makes a comment on my PR and I got to go fix it. But it's been, I don't know, three weeks since I last looked at it. I got to go remember (laughs) what, what was I last doing here? Uh, what was it supposed to do? What was the reasoning for having this change that is completely uncommented and people <laughs> keep getting hung up on? Should have commented. <laughs> um, uh, you know, well, you know, that change was just to shut up a test or something mm-hmm. like that. And yeah. I don't remember the reason for it anymore. <laughs> how, do you get, how do you get in your flow? Do you have like a, a time of day where you get flow state? Is it a... Um, not really. Although... For some reason, it always ha- happens around 11 p.m. <laughs> so you have a time of day. <laughs> so, 
I like I'll just end up being like you know most of the day for some reason you know I work on some stuff but like nothing really like jumps out at me that I really gotta finish and then somehow at 11 p.m. I always find something that's like all right I gotta finish this before I go to bed and then five hours later <laughs> um, it's uh very similar to how I write the bent I wait till 11 a.m. It's supposed to be out at 9 a.m. and then I'm like ah shit yeah two hours late already <laughs> Great work ethic. Yeah. Well, yeah, well. I do have a full-time job, too. I am working <laughs> as I have, well. Um, so, so do you have any, like, suggestions of someone is, you know, aspiring to contribute to, to Bitcoin Core? Like, how, how best for them to dive into this? Like, uh, I think the best way is just to, is really to start small and look at, like, simple things that uh, you yourself want to fix. Like, use Bitcoin Core yourself. And find something that bothers you or something you don't like and try to fix it or change it and see how that goes. Yeah, you got pissed off at uh, at hardware wallet support and, and made something pretty big. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> there have been a bunch of um, other... I have some other wallet projects I've been working on that are just like, I want this to be better. And uh, <clears throat> learning about how the wallet works so I can change it and make it better. So like, yeah, so if you want to, I think this goes for many open source projects. It's use it yourself, find something you don't like and fix it. Yeah. No, it's, uh, and, uh, you can also go my way, uh, my, the, the way I got into it originally. And that's just hang around where users are and see what they complain about and try to fix it yourself too. Is Bitcoin talk still as lively today as it was when you first got in? It's pretty lively. It's a lot of junk. Mm -hmm. Um, since I moderate some of the forums, I do have to log in and like pay attention occasionally, but I haven't really commented there in a while. Yeah. <clears throat> I mean, for you freaks that don't know, BitcoinTalk.org was the place, the forum to be back in the day. Yeah. where Satoshi was talking outside of the mailing list. Yeah. Um, yeah. There's a lot of historic threads that are really interesting. Yeah, you got the HODL, the HODL meme, Satoshi, you got Hal Finney in 2010 predicting Bitcoin banks. Yeah. Um, you have Dan Larimer getting told off. Uh, you have the epic forum redesign that's always two uh, weeks, yeah. away, two weeks away. How forever. many Bitcoin did they must race? Oh that? man, or not they uh, Was oh, it famous? There was a beta about a year ago. <laughs> <laughs> what a joke! Beta site isn't up anymore, um, but the software is called Epoch Talk, and it is like actively being worked on. If you want to take a look at it. Uh, I and haven't. I just feel like that's such a Bitcoin thing to do. Is like, you want to re redesign the forum, so you just rewrite a whole new yep. like forum stack instead of like borrowing from other people. Yeah, there there are things that Thamos wanted to have specifically that that are in Bitcoin Talk because he patched some PHP to make it work, but I guess he wanted it like as a feature itself. Yeah. Because PHP is back into a lot of CMSs, right? Yeah, it's also not that great. Yeah, it's uh. There I, have been. I had many... a lot of experience with Drupal back in the day. I understand yeah. that it's not great. Bitcoin Talk has has had many um. Many modifications to make it more secure. Okay. Uh, I don't remember what they are, but I remember looking at the list. <laughs> yeah, because then somebody. It wasn't Bitcoin Talk. It was the GMX email. That's somebody like that yeah it expired um, and satoshi's username got taken there have been yeah i think it was the emails that got taken over yeah uh yeah and then someone actually um someone actually got hal finney's account recently well really uh on bitcoin talk well i say recently i mean like i guess it was nine months ago <laughs> yeah, um it started posting something and then it swiftly got locked down and banned what were they posting? I don't even remember. They're all it's all deleted. <laughs> they brought me back. <laughs> yeah, uh, but I know that I know when that happened, um, Thamos or one of the other admins uh, shut it down really quickly. Yeah, I mean, I would imagine. Yeah, um, that's actually one thing I hope Twitter doesn't do now that they're shutting down all the inactive so Twitter let, accounts. Let people take old names. But they backtracked on that, didn't they? I don't. I, I don't know. I, I think don't. it's. I think it's Europe only. I don't know. Last it was night. Europe only, and then they backtracked. 
Is my I don't know. I just I just hope the running Bitcoin tweet doesn't come down. Well, he's American. So. <laughs> That's a great tweet. Right. I uh, yeah. I don't know about that. Yeah. Um. All right, switching topics here. You, I noticed you were talking about coin joins um, oh, yeah. coin the other joins. week too. Let's talk about coin joins. What are your thoughts on them? What are the, uh, what are your thoughts on the um, the products that exist that allow people to coin join today? How they could be better? How mm-hmm. they're, or actually more importantly, how they they fall short and how they could be better. Yeah. More importantly, uh, coin- talk about coin selection too. Oh, so great. mix that in. There. <laughs> coin coin joins are great. Uh, they're great for privacy. Um, and they're uh, a hard problem to coordinate. <laughs> I haven't really. So the most I've most of coin joins that I've done have been um, manual coin joins, like me uh, find random people to coordinate a coin join together, and it ends up being with me or whoever's coordinating it, knowing everything, which some people uh, some people trust me, uh, I guess. Um, and and so that's not really a problem but like this isn't something that you can do regularly it's kind of annoying it takes a lot of time and there's always there's always that guy that doesn't respond or yeah well that guy just doesn't respond <laughs> um and i know that greg maxwell does does a lot of manual coin joins for so this around you times. just can't scale that that can how do you yeah, do it's just not scalable how do you do a ma- like how would you set up a manual <clears throat> coin join uh, not what a docs your procedure or anything, but it's, well, now it. I haven't done one in a while, but this would be for PSPD, by the way. So this is a lot more annoying. You would tell everyone to send send a uh, TXID and V out. Also required them to know what that meant, uh, and then I would use Core to do create raw transaction, make a transaction. Oh, yeah, they have to send TXID V out. Uh, couple addresses and the amounts that they want to those addresses <laughs> and then uh, if you're trying to avoid subset sum analysis you have to say uh, one of these outputs has to be exactly I don't know 0.1 Bitcoin uh, and then everyone sends it to me and make the transaction you gotta send it back out to everyone else and then they sign it and then I have to send it back to me and some and I have to combine them all using some we have a command for that I think combine raw transaction mm-hmm. it merges them all together and then you can broadcast it but requires a lot of back and forth it requires people to know what a TXID and a vout mean uh, requires them to know how to sign a raw transaction and requires them to also be online all the time like, and you have to trust each other and then they have to trust me to not to dox, dox them all and yeah. you have to send it through secure channels so that yeah, it and doesn't then, leak out then uh, you know they'll PGP encrypt it or use Signal or use like OTR or something. Send it to me, and then uh, it's very diff. It's really time consuming to do this manually. So like we do have some stuff that does it automatically now, uh, like what well, Join Market and Wasabi. They mm-hmm. both do coin joins in the background. And Whirlpool Samurai. Yeah, it's Samurai, but. Well, I haven't used them, so I, I don't have much to say about them. I used Join Market back in the day, uh, like the very first few releases, and the user experience was fine. But I don't know how they, what they really did in the background. Yeah, uh, is the I didn't look into that much. But the user experience is fine for you. Yeah, but I don't think that's really scalable either. <laughs> no. Well, and going back to uh, you creating coin joins with individuals directly yeah is that does something like uh adam get some snicker make that easier because you could just broadcast uh well i haven't read it okay. so i don't know all right um but i know that PSPT does make this a bit easier now mm-hmm. uh we introduced a we i introduced a join PSPTs command that takes multiple PSPTs and makes them into a coin join cool so uh now if you want to do it manually you would say Create a PSP. Have your wallet create an unsigned PSPT, and just send that to me, and then I'll use this command to join them all together. So now it's slightly less you know, like you don't have to know, uh, you don't have to know how to get your outputs, and you don't have to know how to make a change address and all that. Yeah, it's slightly easier, but still, still a bit time consuming. Well, thank you for that. 
Um, what are your what are your thoughts on coin join as uh, the predominant fungibility solution going forward? Do you think it's sufficient? Do you think I think. Well, I mean, confidential transactions would be nice, but it's probably not going to happen. Uh, I think coin joins would be sufficient if most, like, not not even most, like the vast majority of people use them. And but of course, it's always there's still that problem of how are we coordinating coin joins, and you know that's what everyone's been trying to solve. That's how, that's why Wasabi does their Chamian server thing. Join Market does whatever they do uh we've had the pay join idea but i don't think anyone's really using that the join That's... market the maker is coordinating right so join market has makers but they don't know everything i think there's some way that they are able to mask uh information so that it's not uh so that one party doesn't necessarily know everything yeah. but join market has had vulnerabilities where uh it's possible for people to find out what the inputs or who owns which inputs oh. and they have constant improvements and stuff yeah well you mentioned pay join and that to me seems like the most makes the most sense right just make every transaction a, a yeah so pay join i uh, was part of the group that came up with this which was to you would do a coin join with the person you're paying uh it's, it's a nice idea but requires merchants to adopt it and i'm not confident on uh, like say BitPay, but BTC Pay Adopting helps this. here. Right? What about BTC Pay? Yeah, BTC Pay. I mean, big. yeah, it'd be great. Uh, and and I don't know if they do, but yeah, They're BTC Pay it, doing it. Yet. And then, but like, a lot of businesses still use co- uh, Coinbase or BitPay to do their. Not us. Processing. We're BTC Pay loyalist here. Yeah. We're trying to make BTC more people. BTC Pay is like that. new. It's like pretty new. It's I think pretty it's new. A, that's but, why it's a game changer. But but and it I'm, has no I'm fees. A, the market's oh, yeah, going to choose BTC Pay, right? Well. See, I'm a bit of a pessimist, and I think that people are going to go with the easiest thing that they can do, which is Fair. send a URL to BitPay instead of firing up my own server, running a node, and figuring out how to configure this thing. <laughs> I'm a bit of a pessimist. I, I'm going to go with well. It's good that you're the a easiest. Pessimist. The easiest option is just to have someone else do it. But there's there's so, a middle ground there, right? Where you could have like <laughs> a thousand little BitPays that are all hosting BTC Pays, right? Yeah. You know, like a BTC Pay as a service. Yeah, I and guess then there's that, like a competitive I mean. market there at least. Mm-hmm. They'd be more likely to implement something like pay join. Yeah, keep but fees lower. even then, uh, because it ends up being a custodial service. Yeah. Like, you need to find someone that's trustworthy, and I, don't, I, I wouldn't consider BitPay trustworthy, <laughs> but like, they've been around long enough to show that they haven't really stolen or lost any Bitcoin. That like, it's not that I know of, um, but there was an instance. So they're, in they're kind of trustworthy. That they did recently. That's that brings which, me, which so, incident? There was there was a Hong Kong Kong uh, organization yeah. that had their BitPay account frozen. Oh right yeah, there. well that's a risk you run with any Cus- service custodian, like that. Yeah. So that's, that actually brings up a good point. Like, what is uh, why are you in Bitcoin? Why do you? How do you? You're pessimistic about users <laughs> uh, running their own full nodes and. Ex- accepting validating their own transactions and coming transactions what uh what are you well, building no, I'm, I'm pessimistic about businesses doing it mm-hmm. because businesses also have bureaucracy and regulations to follow mm-hmm. uh, users i'm slightly more optimistic about them running their own full nodes uh, especially with like people advocating for people to run their own full nodes and stuff are we and all ma- are we mountain easy. men are we all crazy mountain men maybe i don't know <laughs> Uh, but at least like running your own full node is pretty easy as a as a user and you know it's your money that you're taking care of but as a business running your own full node and wallet well if you're a public company you've got shareholders to respond to and you have regulations to follow so maybe it's not as easy to run a full node and you also have to you have user data you might have to like hold on to this is what we're trying to get away from i say we just tftc if we ever grow into a unicorn (laughs) we're bootstrapping with btc pay and going up and that's what actually is is that time of the year we're doing our taxes and uh oh shit taxes we uh we are the first year we had the business up so i had to report uh everything we received via btc pay and again the software 
makes everything really easy. Like, mm. um, and yeah, it is easy to comply. Like, they, they, like you can comply. Right. Um, it just takes work. It just it does take work, but it, it'll get easier. I think. Uh, yeah. Hopefully it'll get easier. <laughs> it, I'm hoping it'll get easier, but the other thing with paid join is it requires interactivity, right? The, the recipient well, any coin needs to join be online. Requires yeah. Interactivity. Yeah. Pay join requires the recipient to be online. If it's a merchant, I'm, they'll be online. It's a, you expect them to be online because their website's still up. Um, right, right. <laughs> uh, but like, if it's a, another person, they might not be online, or it could just be like a donation address that someone's sending to. Then you can't do a pay join for that. Yeah. <clears throat> but like, pay join's a. If wallets implemented it, I think that's a great way for coin joins to really take off more. Yeah. BTC pay. Listen. Think, yeah. BTC pay is going to implement it. It's going to be a game changer. Uh, you can Core put me on the record for that. Core will do it eventually. Core will do it eventually? Probably. Maybe. Yeah. I make no promises. <laughs> when I say Core will do it, it will most likely be I will implement it into Core <laughs> at some point after descriptor wallets and what hardware wallets. And uh, the other thing I was doing, which was, I don't even remember what it was anymore. Uh, we were lucky Something with multi-wallet. Yeah. We were lucky, man. What's it, what's it like working at, at the protocol level like, and, and working on this project? Do you, um, do you really I take know, it time? It just feels like normal. I, I'm not sure what normal software engineering should feel like, though. It's just kind of it's work to do. <laughs> like what? What? types of projects were you working on before bitcoin uh bitcoin was my first major well actually i think bitcoin was my first open source project i got into uh because i was in high school and you know not like i was going to do anything else and not like i was looking at anything else yeah you've never known a world without building <laughs> on bitcoin Damn, yeah that's man. weird All right do you uh i mean i had but like other open source projects that you look at are scary like I don't know. Have you ever looked at the Linux kernel? <laughs> that's, just, that's scary. I don't know. Who wants to touch that? <laughs> no. Uh, you were talking to somebody who's never looked at uh, the Linux kernel. We just talked about it. I just bought the uh, uh, a book that has the Bitcoin, first version of the Bitcoin source code in it. Um, mm-hmm. I will I will look through that, but that's about as much code digging as I can do. <laughs> yeah. I mean, I've, I've read some of the Linux kernel mailing list stuff, and I was like, this is way beyond me. <laughs> it's far scarier. That's, you're blowing my mind. You're way younger than me, and you've contributed. I mean, thank you again. Like Matt said, like we're lucky to have you working on this stuff, and mm. you don't. It, it's just like nothing to you. It's crazy. <laughs> <laughs> you're just born into it. I fucking love it. Born into it. Yeah. yeah. So like, what, what, like, what, what is your vi- grand vision of Bitcoin in the future? Like, how, what do you see it enabling or potentially enabling? Do you think Matt Corallo came in here about a year and a half ago and said Bitcoin has a five percent? chance of succeeding um uh i don't know i don't think that far ahead no nah, well like <laughs> what, what do you how far ahead do you think just about a week <laughs> 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 needs needs to be up by next needs to be up uh next week so, and still up next week. <laughs> so do you find this more of just like an interesting uh intellectual engineering project or yeah that's that's mostly how i came into bitcoin it was just an interesting interesting to to work on and think about yeah uh as for like where it's going, uh, that's not something I really consider. Um, I'm just mainly since I'm working on the wallet is just to make it make it easier to do more things, uh, make it easier to like do more multi sigs or more. I guess you could do lightning scripts and HTLCs and core after descriptor wallets. Shit. Uh, just make it do. Uh, let the user have more options. Yeah. No, it's great. I mean. This is the uh, the common uh, the common not verbatim response, but paraphrase response I get from core developers. You get yeah. so, like you're inherently uh, drawn by the intellectual um, from observation, intellectual uh, challenge, and then you really don't think you like I, fo- I, focus on the long term success. Yeah, I think some, that's probably yeah. That's probably how a lot of the Bitcoin core developers got into it anyways and it's just the mindset that keeps you going <laughs> yeah and do you think that yeah do you think that's the exact right mindset to have when approaching this stuff um well kind of it's an open source project and i feel like there shouldn't be 
that much of a huge grand vision that like the core project should be pushing for yeah but, no, that's a very like very valid and great point and so how as an engineer like out looking at us twitter podcaster oh geez crazy bitcoin <laughs> users like what is uh what do you think of the outside world non-engineering world um mostly boils down boils down to uh lull and then scroll <laughs> <laughs> That's that's about my interaction with Twitter. <laughs> it's all noise. <laughs> hmm? You think it's all noise? A lot of it's noise. Yeah, yeah, yeah most of it is. <laughs> I would agree. I would contribute to it a lot too. Occasionally, someone will say something wrong, and then I go, "Hey, by the way, you're wrong." <laughs> <laughs> that's that's what it. Twitter's for. Yeah, yeah. It's just dunking on people. Well, that's uh, not a dunk. That's a correction. Mm. It could be a dunk. It depends on how you word it. What do you what do you do outside of Bitcoin? Uh, I read books and I play video games. That's what, about uh, it. what kind of books do you like? Uh, usually sci fi. Yeah. I've been reading the Expanse, the Expanse novels. Oh, I want to start that. I watched the show. Yeah, I watched the show. I'm like, this is based on a book, so I'm gonna read the books. Yeah. The show is there great. Is, yeah, there are nine books, and I'm on like book four. I fucking love sci fi. What's your favorite video game right now? Oh man. Um. Recently, well, I recently started playing The Witcher, and then, but like, uh, one of my favorite games has been Skyrim. Skyrim, is that just is that like the huge, hours and, like expansive universe? Yeah, so it's an, you call it, uh, it's an RPG, and with dragons. <laughs> you see, you're, you're talking to somebody who hasn't gamed in like five years. Yeah, I'm big on I'm big on video games. I know, I know. <laughs> uh, Sats and games, Bitcoin and games. It's gonna happen, right? Oh man, I don't, I kind of don't want it to. Really, Why not? you don't want to? Mm, okay, well, this comes from my uh, the the gaming part of me of I dislike microtransactions. Fair. And and what do you dislike about them? The incentivization behind the incentiv the the incentives it produces and the um, uh, unfunness of the games it makes. Yeah, I'm not a big gambler either. Like, I don't like gambling. Like, yeah. So like having. Like the Lightning Network in games, or having people paying with Sats in games. I don't know. It that's the whole uh, microtransaction thing, and but I'm it could not be a whole, not a huge fan of that. The reason microtransactions in games right now fucking sucks is because it's all built around these like closed systems that are designed to give the publisher like a shit ton of money. Yeah, and and it kind of creates like this pay, play to the pay to win environment a lot of times, or or just. It's just outright malicious because it's like skins or something like that. Yeah. But if you actually use like real money, like Bitcoin, um, there's some situations there where you can develop like P2P games or something where you kill someone and you get a few sats and they lose a few sats. That seems less, um, it seems like a whole different concept than like our current brew of microtransactions. Yeah. But that also just mean I wouldn't want to play it because then I'd be losing money. Unless you kill people, right? If you're good at it, you could, you know, make a living out of it, maybe. Make a living camping, you know, in a (laughs) shooter game or something. (laughs) What do you do for a living? Oh, I just sit by the spawns and Counter-Strike. Well, what what were the... uh... Well, then that that just produces unfun behavior, right? Yeah, exactly. You you need a good game. The game needs to be structured (laughs) well, right? It can't be a broken game. Uh, I don't... I'm just not a huge fan of the microtransactions in in any game. I I, I, I I really just want to, you know... I pay once and I get the game and all its content. That's fair. And then I can just grind it for a few hundred hours. <laughs> Do I need to get a system? Am I falling behind? Absolutely. <laughs> <laughs> Very good answer. Uh, I want to jump back into. I like. I really want to talk about coin selection. Okay, fine. all right. Coin we selection. Talk about coin selection. What are your thoughts on it? It's, it's fucked right now. It's, it's pretty awful. shitty. Wasabi's got uh, coin ho- selection, Electrum, and then that's about it, right? Well, so coin selection is a hard problem. Uh, literally, like I think it is. Uh, it's a subset of the uh, subset sum problem or something like. Uh, fuck, what's it called? There's a computer science problem that is very similar to um, coin selection, uh, where you have you have a bag of numbers and you want to choose the correct number, of, like the certain ones of them that meet meet. Meet. <laughs> this happens to me all the time. Don't worry. Meet Literally a certain goal. 
that that meet a certain goal. Like so, in Bitcoin, you you have a bunch of UTXOs with some value, and you are trying to meet the uh, amount you're trying to send. And this happens to be a hard problem, I believe, like computationally hard, uh, because there are so many possible combinations, and and then you also have to decide what is quote unquote best. How do you de- and how do you define best? And the two big things are fees and privacy, right? It's yeah, like, so you gotta you have you to balance privacy, fees now, and fees in the future. Right. So we have um, there are a ton of different different strategies. You know, you've got your your first in first out or largest output, or um, uh, the Bitcoin Core thing, or the uh, branch and bound algorithm, and tons, tons of other things. But if you consider like largest first uh sort them by order and you just pick the biggest one this definitely optimizes for lowest fees now right right you got one input and it becomes two outputs probably Mm -hmm. but what does that become in the future what are your fees going to be in the future well you've taken your biggest output you've cut in in half and now you cut that in half again and you cut in half and it just goes to dust well you've got a bunch of dust outputs and if say you haven't been receiving that much, but you you're sending a lot or something, uh, you've got 50 dust outputs, and now your fee now is humongous. Uh-huh. So your coin selection algorithm needs to balance for not just what your fee is going to be now, but what is it going to be in the future? How is how are the UTXOs in your wallet going to change as you use this algorithm? And this is a combination of the coin selection algorithm and maybe wallet UX of warning people, hey, maybe you should consolidate this dust, or is that yeah. something that's untenable? Uh, it, it's a bit of both, I guess. Mm-hmm. Um, consolidation hasn't been something I've been thinking that much about. but Because we, ideally you want your selection algorithm to... Realize like, that it's creating dust. or Well, yeah, to not require consolidation. Okay. But well, that's fees hard. go up. When fees go up, right? People yeah, are going to start consolidating. Yeah, and, and uh, with coin selection, you also have to consider, well, this output might not be dust now, but in a couple months, if the fee fee rate shoots up to like 100 Satoshis per byte, uh, that might be dust then. And that's that was, <laughs> We found this out in 2017. Yeah. Did Coinbase have like $3 million worth of dust they couldn't move or something yeah. like that? A lot of people ran into dust problems when the fee rate shot up. So like... Coin selection has been very difficult to find that balance. Uh, the algorithm that Bitcoin Core uses now, uh, we call Branch Unbound, which was developed by, well, designed by Mark Earhart, also known as Merch. Or ah. yeah, he's the main Bitcoin Stack Exchange. Yes, uh, he's he's mod. the Bitcoin Stack Exchange um, head honcho. Yes, <laughs> uh, and he wrote. Uh, his master's thesis designing this algorithm and analyzing it and other ones. So it's actually, it's like, it's an actual scientific paper and it's a great read. If you want to go learn about coin selection algorithms and how they all suck, um, <laughs> it's on his website somewhere. Uh, and I've dropped the link. The link's actually in the core source code, I think. Uh, yeah. In our description of branch and bound. So branch and bound is, um, it does an exhaustive search of every possible combination of UTXOs, basically. So that's intensive. That is, uh, this is also why it's considered hard. It's n factorial, right? You got n factorial number of possibilities, which is, which uh, if you were to iterate through every single one of them, would be literally take forever. And so what we did was, um, so what Merch did was basically. You design design it as a tree of include this UTXO, exclude this UTXO, and like like that, uh, and by sorting them, sorting the UTXOs, we can say if we include this and we're over, and we like we're over our we have an upper limit because uh, we're trying to do an exact match. If we're over our target, we can now ignore everything else that includes this UTXO, which does mean we cut off. Tons of this tree, which is why it's yeah. called branch and bound, mm-hmm. because we're bounding it, uh, which makes the search time way faster. So it's basically, I mean, 
It's kind of a tree. Yeah, I was going to just butcher it like a Merkle tree with a bunch of branches cut off. And yeah, one, one you can consider it like a kind of like a Boolean tree where every level is whether to include a UTXO at that level, a specific UTXO. So like you start with, do I include the largest one or do I not? Then, yes, I included it or no, I did not include it. Okay, the second largest one. I included the largest one and am I including the second one and so on. So it becomes a tree. Mm -hmm. And then you just cut off you start cutting off the branches where it doesn't make sense to keep including more because you've already gone past your limit. Yeah, so one one input. Yeah, if, if one... Uh, um, I, I can't even try to explain that. <laughs> and yeah. this, doesn't, this, this requires a whiteboard. Yeah. <laughs> this doesn't include privacy at all. Privacy considerations at all, right? <coughs> Not at all. Yeah. You're, that uh, just so, the privacy, so the privacy part comes in with if you want to... Um, it's a common you, input heuristic, right? Well, the, so privacy is when you get to... It's the pre-processing step before the coin selection. So you get to when you get to the algorithm, you just say, here's a bunch of numbers, basically. That's what you tell right. it. But in your pre-processing, you might combine... Uh, you might say, we're going to group all of these UTXOs and treat them like one. So... This is their number stuck together. Because they're already linked, so it doesn't matter yeah. if you combine them. They're linked or they're the same one. Uh, it's the same address. So let's just call it as one when we give it to the coin selection. Well, people shouldn't be reusing addresses anyway. Yeah, you shouldn't, yeah. but it happens. Yeah. Right. And then in core, we have, a, we have a thing now that does that. It'll group together. Uh, this is an option you have to enable. But you have all of your, any reused addresses will be grouped together as one. And so the so branch and bound algorithm will think of it as one UTXO. Yeah, that makes sense. Uh, and the other thing that the one uh, privacy thing that um, branch and bound does work with is a change. So branch and bound is an exact match, which means you don't make change. Ah. Everything that you do, you you won't make something that's linkable because uh, it all just goes to the merchant okay. or fees. There's so many goddamn things to think <laughs> about. Coin selection. Well, like best PSPT. case scenario, there's no fees, but sometimes there's and there's no change, right? But sometimes there's change. Yeah. Obviously. So if, if there it is doesn't change, have a combination. so if branch unbound fails, uh, which happens fairly often because you can't always find a change, uh, no change solution, uh, we fall back to whatever Bitcoin Core was using previously, which is some weird loop that does some random shuffling and some something else. And no one can really describe it because it started as one thing and then just got patches slapped on top. <laughs> it's uh, It works decently well, um, but it has this minor problem of not considering dust. Or rather, not considering that something is dust. So if you have dust, it'll probably spend it. Yeah. Well, dust is such a hard... Right? Because it's so contextual relative to whatever the fee market is yeah. at any given point in time right yeah so with um it's such like a that's what I, we've had drew been saw on in the past who created the concept of hodl waves and mm -hmm. doing chain geology research to see when people are moving utxs and brought up the concept of a dust holiday which intrigued me at first but you can't really it's never it, gonna happen yeah and miners would, would There's never no go with game it. theory there yeah 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 so with um, with branch and bound, it's an exact match with a with a fuzzy fence. Okay. Uh, basically, the idea is that it, this uh, this was one of the main innovations of it, which was instead of we're choosing exactly this value, it's we're choosing this value plus some buffer that we're willing to discard as do, uh, as fee, mm -hmm. even though all it'll just boost our fee rate. So you don't get could, the change, could but be higher. we weren't we aren't going to get the change, and yeah. the idea is that. If we make a change, we have the fee that we're going to pay to make it and the fee we have to pay to spend that change in the future. So what if instead of dealing with that fee in the future after we made the change, what if we just consider that as the excess that we are willing to waste? And so that is our buffer. Just how much are we? Well, it's not even a waste. It would be the premium you're willing to pay yeah. to avoid future Headaches, I mean, right? it would it would basically be we're gonna pay this now, or we can we can pay this in the future, or we can pay it now, mm -hmm. 
And the benefit is that we won't make a change output. The benefit is privacy. Yeah, you're doing the benefit sh- is we get a bit more privacy and uh, you have one less UTXO to deal with. Yeah. And you, and potentially just don't have money that you can't use. Right? Yeah. yeah. It's also It also ends up being fairly consolidatory. Uh, in the simulations I've ran, it does pretty okay. <laughs> pretty comparable to Core in that uh, it keeps the the number of UTXOs in your wallet like kind of down. Core the core wallet does consolidate a lot because it, it'll eat your dust outputs and spend them. Uh which means you're you're losing money. <laughs> but it happens. Um I have a bunch of simulation results that compare all of that compare branch and bound and core and uh, it's interesting to see how how they perform. How well do these simulations track uh, live action? Like, uh... well, so you remember um, back in twenty twelve, twenty thirteen, there was uh, it was Money Pot. Uh, there was a there was a gambling thing called Money Pot. Or uh, what was that? A long time ago, there was this gambling site called Money Pot, <clears throat> and the guy who ran it published all the uh, deposits and withdrawals. So uh, that became our simulation data. <laughs> At least one chunk of our sim- simulation was data. Was it like Satoshi Dice? I don't even remember what it did. Uh, I just know it was, it was a gambling site ran by Ryan Havar. Okay. And uh, he also ran Bust a bit and they did the same he did the same thing there, published the numbers. So for all of uh, our simulation data uh, some of the simulations have been using those. Okay. And then the rest of it, I've just been choosing blocks by random in the blockchain and pulling out all their, all the numbers from them. Oh, so you can just use. So Bit- it's like it's not even like randomly generated. You it's can like, use Bitcoin's current state. Or- yeah, it's just like uh, I'm gonna pick that block and go through every transaction and all the outputs they make. Uh, randomly select whether they're gonna be inputs or uh, whether they're gonna be deposits or withdrawals, and. That's those are my numbers. Oh, fascinating. I never thought it would be. It also takes like six hours. I, I thought you would have had to create like your own, like fake. No, that's too much work. Yeah. <laughs> fascinating. So what uh, what are the steps to making this coin join solution? Uh, coin selection. Coin, coin selection. selection. Coin. Yeah, <laughs> coin selection. I'm really glad we brought it, brought back up coin selection. This has been yeah, this has been, been fascinating. Days. So you're working on it now testing it out um, um so branch amount has already merged mm-hmm. it's been merged for a long time what we're work what i've been working on is replacing the fallback so we fall back to core when we need to make change uh but in merch's thesis he suggested that we use just a simple random selection because apparently just randomly picking outputs does That's pretty better. well does a better job somehow uh core kind of does that but like with more steps on top. Um, it's not entirely random. But just if you just randomly select outputs with a bit of uh, bounds on like how small of a change you can make, uh, it does apparently it does pretty well and the simulations have showed that. The main the main problem has been when we do all of this, we're ignoring our dust outputs, which means that if you compare the numbers direct the simulation numbers directly, we have the mean number of UTXOs, the average number of UTXOs in the wallet ends up being way higher when we do branch and bound with random selection fallback. And that's almost entirely because we don't clean up the dust outputs. Mm -hmm. That would make sense, right? Yeah. Like as soon as I modified core to ignore dust outputs and like, it's pretty close. It still does a little bit, a bit better. So how, how would core, how does it currently identify dust outputs basically? There's, it you have them. a function that says is dust and it takes a fee rate. <laughs> but the fee rate, like, is there dust rate? The fee rate is what? Like well, one Satoshi? Yeah, there is. The like, fee rate is. Like Binance. Was it Binance or. <clears throat> who just consolidated all their tether, you, like 546 yeah. sets? Yeah, so. Yeah. Dust House has a really dumb definition. <laughs> this, is, this is a fun one. <laughs> So the original definition of dust was you take the minimum relay fee uh, and the cost it would and 
so however much uh, how many satoshis it would cost to spend an output at the minimum relay fee but one third of that was dust because is the theory that you could wait longer because like how long I don't I don't know what what it was but like originally it was like you know the fee rate was the minimum relay fee which was set by your mempool but it's like how many blocks like how many it's not how many blocks it's just based on what is oh like one sapper byte it's one sapper byte usually but like what is the uh, so the minimum relay fee depends on how full your mempool is right 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 so as soon as the mempool hits its limit it starts popping up the min relay fee so it doesn't accept any more transactions at once so it's usually one sapper byte uh, it'll go up when your mempool hits 300 megabytes, mm-hmm. which is n- freaking huge. <laughs> no one really. I don't than think the that's chain ever state happened, right? actually. Or no, what the megabytes? Megabytes. Gigabyte, yeah. gigabytes. I, megabytes. I was thinking in gigabytes. My bad. The um, so the min relay fee is one. The calculation was something like the fee to spend the output, uh, but one third of that or something, or maybe it was three times. Th- there was a three somewhere in there. Uh, eventually we got rid of this definition and replaced it with we created a dust relay fee a separate variable uh, anything and it was just at that dust relay fee the cost to spend the, the that output and that was the dust value for it and that dust relay fee to make it compatible with the original definition was uh, is 3 sats per byte so it makes the calculation so much easier yeah <laughs> So the original way was that you could have like millisats being dust, or depending on what your relay fee was, or, or, or uh, I mean, like you can still have millisats. It's yeah. it was like, I mean, the the, the number boiled down to five forty six sats. Yeah. Um. But the and same with the new dust relay fee, but it's a it's a straightforward calculation now. Yeah. So when we do our coin selection, we just use the dust relay fee to determine if something is dust. And then we might change the fee rate. Um, like, what if the fee rate... Dust relay fee, I think, will also change depending on mempool. I'm not sure. Uh, but, like, for our coin selection stuff, we have a long-term fee rate. Okay. Which is, like, the 1,008 block <laughs> <laughs> prediction. <laughs> Which is always one sapper byte, anyways. I mean, are you? I've, I've seen it change like once. Are you worried about the fee fee uh, fee market developing at all? Do you think about that? Not really. Yeah. I mean, I'll think about it when I do my coin selection stuff, and I'm like, ah, uh, well, you can't really avoid it, so. Yeah. Oh well. So, like right now, if you want to do coin selection with privacy in mind, you have to just manually coin select. Yeah, pretty much. Uh, no one really considers that much of privacy i think i guess with the coin selection that maybe wasabi does because that's their point no wasabi wasabi just wasabi forces just on joints. the user and it, but it forces on the user it gives you manual coin selection and you have to decide oh samurai's plan is they're trying to do like a where they almost do like a localized chain analysis to try and determine what links are between the different utxos hmm. and, and select accordingly Okay, I don't know, but like it's a like super hard problem. As a so. user, yeah. as a user, I personally like being forced to coin select. Like I like that Wasabi forces so, you to label and select. I'm actually fairly wary of user coin selection. Why? Because users will optimize for the wrong thing. Why I do think. you say that? Um, users will probably optimize for minimum fee. That's not what I've been optimizing for. Well, you're not a normal user. I'm a user. <laughs> a lot of a lot of people just optimize for the minimum fee, right? Right. What do you think? Do you consider your change? How large your change especially is? Especially when fees go up. Yeah. People get greedy really quick. Yeah. So, like, but do you consider when you do your coin selection? Do you consider change? Like, how big is your change output going to be? Yeah, I don't. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. Yeah. So. Are you scolding me right now? Not really. <laughs> um, but coin selection, changing coin selection has a impact on the utxo set uh in general like uh this merch's first pr and maybe only pr to core was changing coin selection and it got reverted because if you looked at the utxo set there was a humongous spike when that version of core got released 
and because because it was just creating more change. It was making it was making more dust. Mm-hmm. It was reducing. It was the, something something like you had way overshot the target. So let's and we had we overshot it because we had included a bunch of extra UTXOs that were not needed at all. So remove those. So the change would be really get smaller, and sometimes it would just be too small, and be basically dust. Um, this was in the 0.12 release, uh, where the in the 0.12 release, if you look at the time it was released and you look at the UTXO set size on like Statoshi, you will see that there's a pretty big spike. And and that that means that it puts an additional burden on all everyone who runs a flat yeah it it burdens everyone who runs Node, uh, yeah. So if if every user did manual coin selection, I think that they would optimize for the wrong thing and could cause a huge increase in UTXO growth. A bloat. Yeah. Yeah. But then fees would probably rise, and then it should. Calibrate. Mm, it, That's the idea. It might of the fee, consolidate. Right? It might consolidate, but it might also just yeah. like people might consolidate, but they might just see it's dust and can't do anything with it right, right. at that fee rate. Yeah. So, how? Uh, yeah. What are your What are your your thoughts on the current uh, chain state and its growth? Um, um, it's think pretty big. You think it's too big? Uh, I think we're pacing well. I think it's it's a bit larger than I would like it to be. But I think everyone thinks that. Uh, we've had a lot of performance improvements that make the sync time about the same. So, um, you know, if the chain grows 20% larger, but you've done a performance improvement of 20%, well, the time to sync hasn't changed. <laughs> and that's been happening a lot for the past few releases. Time hasn't really gone up. But I f- don't think we can keep keep that up. Do things like assume UTXO uh, appeal to you? Assume UTXO is very useful. Yeah. Um, for a f- fast sync, uh, I think doing UTXO set commitments and assuming, uh, yeah, I think that'd be good. Like, there's a PR for that, right? Yes, yeah. Yeah. And then, uh, what was the other thing I was going to say? Oh, uh, it doesn't really bother me because I don't sync a node that often. My node is always synced because mm-hmm. it's never off. <laughs> but for, for new users, uh, having a faster sync, like you assume you take so is, I think it's fine. Yeah, it, it makes sense to me as long as you're validating in the background. Right? Yeah. Um, and I, I like the idea of having it, uh, you know, here's the, we're going to start here, but download everything from history so that we can check what, uh, what we started with yeah you can bury the checkpoints deep right yeah right. not checkpoints that's a bad word not, not checkpoints. you're verifying it anyway yeah, yeah. and i th- i think assume utxo would be similar to what we do for assume valid which is like yes. it's not part of consensus it'll just be an extra thing that you can turn on yeah that's packaged with the software you can use pgb pgp key pgp see i'm telling you it's happening right now. <laughs> you can use the keys and yeah. webs of trust too yeah to help cross verify and stuff like that yeah um, but trust. Eh. Yeah, that's true. <laughs> Good point. Um, but are there any f- efficiencies outside of like assume UTXOs that you see helping to reduce chain load? Like with Schnorr signatures, obviously, uh, be huge for this. Or I don't think I don't think Schnorr signatures will no change much because we don't have like signature aggregation yet. I mean, it'll be smaller. Uh, blockchain won't grow as quickly, I guess. With um with Taproot and Schnorr signatures, uh, but that doesn't that doesn't really help what is current like the current state. It won't change. It won't improve anything that already exists. Mm-hmm. It'll just make it better for the future. Yeah, and so that's a pro- so we're so like I I think the main problem is making what do we have now go by faster, uh, rather than in IBD. Yeah, in IBD. Okay. Uh, like, th- we've had a ton of performance improvements. Um, recent ones I've been seeing have been, like, changing around data structures that are to ones that are faster and more efficient, uh, which help. So. What is uh, the one thing Gleb and Peter are working on? Is it Erlay or? Erlay. Erlay, yeah. That would help c- 
considerably with bandwidth, correct? Um, early or is early the early is for transaction relay, not for IBD. So it wouldn't. Okay, it wouldn't. It wouldn't change anything. It's for nodes that are already fully fully downloaded. I believe so. Yes. Yeah. Okay. Interesting. All right. Well, we got bit devs to get to soon. There we go. A couple hours. Yeah, it's a few hours. <laughs> um, is there any any other pressing uh, Bitcoin topics that you want to talk about? You want to talk about hardware wallets? <laughs> yeah, let's do it. What are your thoughts on hardware wallets? What uh, do you have a particular favorite? Uh, uh, they're all great and they all suck <laughs> simultaneously. <laughs> what do you mean by this? Um, as a user, they're great. As a developer, holy crap, <laughs> they're all. Everyone does the same thing, but slightly differently, which makes my job working on HWI much harder. Um, like, you know, they all take a transaction, they all sign it. Well, how are you giving it that transaction? Uh, Trezor takes it in their own, uh, they use protobuf and you have to pack the transaction into a protobuf thing and you send it. But that only works on Trezor. Ledger has its own magic that I haven't looked at because uh, that was implemented by Greg Sanders. What's... I don't know what the magic is. <laughs> do, you, do you have a personal... Uh... I like the cold card. Okay. Because it's the easiest. <laughs> We're big cold card fans on the it's, podcast. Um, and I, I like how they used uh, PSPT with it too because like... Yeah. the uh, When they... With the PSPT stuff on the cold card you just... It's just a, a thing that option. says upload PSPT or it's just the upload file. Uh, and that's all I have to do for the implementation in HWI. It's just upload a PSPT. I don't even have to, I don't even have to deserialize the thing. <laughs> just well, pass it to it. This is, I, I created and sent my first PSPT last week with mm-hmm. Wasabi and uh, Cold Card. And it was mm-hmm. extremely easy. It was, I mean, Luckily, we have Matt here leading the Citadel workshop uh, <laughs> to teach me. I did it on Testnet a couple months ago, but mm-hmm. a couple of weeks ago, I took it upon myself to do it on the mainnet, and it was extremely uh, easy, and it was a fun experience. Yeah. Like moving the SD card from your air-gapped wallet to uh, your computer and then dropping mm-hmm. the, the transaction and broadcasting it from Wasabi. It was like, yeah. wow. It was like another aha moment for me. Like I Probably the biggest aha moment I've had since I first recovered Bitcoin from a seed phrase. <laughs> Seriously. Mm. <clears throat> yeah. I like, I like the cold card. I liked the ledger for a while until I found out how they install apps and update firmware. Um, and then they like the other major players. Ledger Trezor, likes Trezor. Trezor's meh. Trezor has a, Trezor has limitations on what you can do. Um, like, they might add PSBT soon. They yeah. have a SD card slot on the... On the Trezor T. What, yeah. ab- what about uh, solutions like Justin Moon's BitBoy making your own hardware wallet from uh, generalized hardware? Because um, I saw he did, that was PSBT compatible too. Yeah, I too. think that's... that's an, it's an interesting project to do that. Uh, but... I'm not quite sure what what it's trying to solve, <laughs> what problem it's trying to solve. Yeah. Like, disguise. I guess it's maybe may a bit of a maybe it's some of the trust stuff. But it's like supply chain, supply right? chain, and yeah. you mix supply it into chain. a multi sig setup. So then some of the trade offs that you get for like not having a secure element or whatever. Mm-hmm. Yeah, it can help. Um, also- like I mean, I'm I I wouldn't be, and okay, same with Trezor. I wouldn't be convinced that it prevent uh, protect against someone stealing the device. Yeah, it would. Yeah, uh, but like, well, Bitboy was stateless. Is it? Yeah, oh. intentionally. Okay. Yeah, but like, uh, Trezor, I wouldn't be... I'm not convinced that it would protect against someone stealing it. Uh, it definitely Ledger, won't. It definitely won't. Yeah, I know. <laughs> Ledger, Ledger, I'm more convinced that it'll it'll be fine if someone steals it. But then you have different supply chain But then trade-offs. you have, like, you have the Ledger trade-offs. Yeah. Um, and, and the Ledger, the issues that Ledgers have. Uh, cold card, same thing, but... I haven't looked at their hardware that closely. So do you have a, do you have like an ideal vision of what a hardware wallet should be and should do in your mind or? Um, not really. I guess I'm thinking the hardware wallet I want is a cold card in the form factor of a ledger. <laughs> That's about it. You don't like the calculator? I don't like the calculator. 
I dig the calculator. You just want to be a USB stick? I think it's too big. Really? Yeah. I thought it was going to be so much bigger before I got one. Mm. Like in the pictures, it looks way bigger. So yeah. I've always considered it really small because it beat my expectations. Oh, okay. I, maybe it's just because I was used to using Ledger uh, at that time. Yeah. Um, I mean, the Ledger's tiny. Yeah, the Ledger's really small. That's why I like it. Yeah. Uh, the, I, I like the cold card, I guess. Um, also, cold card does not have shit coins. <laughs> Definitely that's an advantage. The, that's the that's one of the better parts of it. <laughs> or one of the best parts of it, I think. What are your thoughts the, on uh, shit coins? Yeah. yeah. <laughs> the uh, especially in, in HWI, uh we've had I've had so many problems trying to get uh firmware built for the devices for testing. Um and they all get hung up on like shit coins. <laughs> like my build will stall on like Something, something, Ethereum. I'm like, I don't care. Why are you building it? Just adds more complexity. Just, yeah, it makes it more annoying to deal with. Well, it looks like Trezor is realizing that, right? And they're offering a Bitcoin-only product yeah. now. And I think I need to fix HWI to build the Bitcoin-only firmware for that. Because I never got around to it. And we, um, for our testing setup. Okay. Yeah. All right. So they all, thankfully now, they all have a simulator. Uh, you start a simulator... And then you can do all the same things to it, but it's just over a different interface. And that's how we test the HWI. Uh, but the simulator needs to be built from source, basically. Okay. Um, oh, fuck. What the hell was I just going to go into? I have something. Um, all right. Go for it. I'm going to remember what I was saying. Um, would you agree that if people are expecting Schnorr in 2020, they're going to be disappointed? <laughs> Probably. Yeah, it's so much, people I'm, were throwing thinking, that around today. Like, I'm oh. thinking that Schnorr, <coughs> it's it's just because of like what everyone has. What Schnorr by itself is capable, like the uh, signature aggregation stuff and all that stuff that people thought it would do, are just not going to be there. Right. Because for the they're not done yet. Implementation. Yeah. yeah. Because it's it's like requires other changes, requires large changes, or it's just not. It's not done, or we're not confident in its safety. But even base snore, we probably won't even base get snore. I think. Well, it's just going to be underwhelming. It's just. <laughs> so we might get it in twenty twenty, but it's going to be underwhelming. When we get it. <coughs> yeah. Uh. I know this is past your week outlook, so. <laughs> a little bit past it, Andrew. I think are you... we might get it in twenty twenty by the end of the year. Like the second week I of think... December. Are you going to prove? I, I, I'm. Go- I, I would put a a less than 50% chance on December 31st. <laughs> um, I dig it. The BIP number is coming soon, I think. Are you going to propose the activation uh, process? No. Everyone's too scared <laughs> to propose the activation process. No, no, you can't propose activation until the, the details have been proposed. you got to wait for Peter to propose, like, BIP Schnorr, BIP Taproot first. Like... Get get the number assigned, then we can right. go deal with activation. Yeah, so right, right. BIP Taproot in its current form is just a warm up until it gets a number. Um, it's just a draft. Just a draft, okay. Which means it can change at any moment, mm-hmm. uh, and you should definitely not implement anything based on it. Yeah, and then because Alex Leishman was telling me that the Taproot review found some versioning problems or something like that. Yeah, the Taproot v- review has. Tabroot Review Club has been finding, coming up, uh, uh, finding some questions and issues that should be answered or things that should be changed. I haven't really, I haven't participated in them, so I'm not up uh, up to date on the details. But I know, like, it's actively being, the BIP's actively being changed uh, based on comments from review. Yeah. Which is good. It means that people care. Yeah. No, it was actually interesting to see how this review process came to be mm-hmm. gay jay towns did the bull by his horns bull mm-hmm. by its horns uh it seems and uh yeah, a lot tech, what was it like 215 uh, people signed up i don't know how many people oh, so participated many people signed up, apparently yeah i i thought about signing up but i was feeling lazy and i didn't know i <laughs> didn't want to i didn't want to hey, review more things no more laziness Andrew. <laughs> you haven't done enough yet oh. <laughs> you're young uh no, I'm kidding. I can't. You're not working nights and weekends in uh, your 20s, and <laughs> so you're not going to be successful. Mm. Yeah. You always got to be working. You always got to be working for those dev incentives, man. What are the dev incentives? What drives you to work on this? 
Absolutely nothing. <laughs> uh, well, this has been fascinating. Yeah. Thank you for responding to my DM. Thanks for reaching out. <laughs> oh, it's right. been it's been interesting. Yeah, it always is. It always is. Matt, do you have any uh, anything you want to end on in particular? I'm just really. Thank you for everything you do. And I'm just really glad I got to be a part of this conversation. And I'm really glad we jumped back into coin selection. <laughs> I thought that was fantastic. Yeah. And Andrew, do you have a parting note for the freaks out there? Uh, no, you should follow me on Twitter, but I don't tw- tweet anything. So maybe you shouldn't. <laughs> follow him on Twitch. He, he, well, he you pops can follow up. me on Twitch and I won't stream for another. Your last stream was December 5th. I checked. A couple weeks. Yeah. December 5th. That was, uh, that was a month ago. I will, okay, I thought about streaming yesterday, but it was only a thought. All right, we need to turn those thoughts into action moving <laughs> forward. I thought the Twitch thing was super cool. That's how I discovered you, mm. was the Twitch streaming. I, I've i Yeah, I got that feedback a lot, that people like it. Yeah. But it's hard to uh, stream when you have nothing to stream. Well, Twitch is a big audience to inundate with Bitcoin information, so mm. you're doing your part yeah. when you do show up. What's your? Let's show your Twitter account. How are they gonna uh, follow you? At all a- of my social stuff is H O one O one A C H O W one zero one. Literally everywhere online, including in games. So if you run into me in a game, you can say hi, and I'll try to destroy you. Yes, <laughs> 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 that's the perfect place to end it. Andrew, thank you for your time. Thanks for having me. Peace and love, freaks. <laughs>